And our last speaker for tonight is Greg Fisher. Uh, he's a serial entrepreneur and inventor with a focus on hardware and manufacturing. Uh, in 2005, he founded the Berkeley Sourcing Group, a turnkey manufacturing service provider, and partnered with small businesses manufacturing overseas. Great. So that was probably the perfect lead-in question for what I'm about to talk about tonight. Um, how, you know, what is the effect? We have a lot of makers, we have stuff going on, there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of reality, and where does it meet, right? What makes the maker movement real? A lot of it is getting products in the hands of people, right? Stuff we make, getting it out there, getting into other people's hands. And from where I come from, uh, you know, we're about producing overseas for these makers. We focus on hardware startups and very small scale, and that is about becoming what is now being termed as kind of a successful hardware startup, right? And the difference is really that a maker makes things, and then a maker that produces a business, creates a business, builds a successful business, and produces for other people, kind of graduates into what we're now terming as a hardware startup. So. How many of you are in software? Raise your hands. All right, so we got a few. We're you know kind of Silicon Valley here. We're used to this idea that we can have an idea, build a product, do it ourselves in the garage, make a million dollars, get it out all over the world. And uh, you know, I, I don't want to simplify it, but I'm not a software guy, so I'm gonna. <laughs> Basically, as I, you know, it's kind of coding and business acumen, right? You, you build a business, you have some code, you build a website, you have, you can do it all with one or two people. Not a really uh, big challenge, right? Obviously. <laughs> 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 but hardware is, is a little bit different. It's uh, You can be a great designer, but there's a lot of stuff. Right? Hardware guy, hardware guy. Hey, all right. Any monkey can go. Great. Well, I wouldn't I didn't say that. <laughs> so you have a lot more, right? You have, fundamentally, it usually starts with engineering. You create a product, you create an idea. Then you have to prototype it. You have to build it. You need prototyping skills. You need access to machines that can make what you're trying to make. Tech shop, awesome. You need money. This stuff isn't cheap. You know, it's, it's a little bit different. You need to buy a lot of uh, materials. You need to try around. You need to uh, do a lot of different things that cost money. You need market feedback. You, with software, you can kind of throw it out there. You can get feedback. With hardware, you spend ten thousand dollars, you throw it out there. Spend another ten thousand dollars, you throw it out there. You want to get as much feedback as you can early and often, so they know that you're making the product that you're willing to invest in, that you're you know raising your money for. Tooling is a big part of that. Uh, you know, tooling for injection molding. You start at anywhere from five thousand. Could be up to one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars for tools to make a mass production product. You can't really skimp. There's no easy way to get in and run that. You can three D print things, and that's great for iteration, but it doesn't really get you the final product as it's going to be produced in its final state. Often, you need an overseas production. You need to know how to manage a team, how to manu manage manufacturing, how to build those relationships, how to communicate, how to bridge, the language barrier, and all of that, you need to know how to manage that. Quality control, you can do all of that, and then you can have a defective uh, issue that goes through your entire production line. That $100,000 gets shipped and arrives at your door and is no longer working. Uh, you need packaging. Packaging is kind of its own little thing. It's just one of these little niches where you need to understand uh, you know, how to present your idea right, how to do the artwork, how to have a really good onboarding experience. Real products can hurt people. It's not just a website, it can, you know, it can be dangerous. It can blow up, it can light on fire. <laughs> it can do lots and lots of things that you probably didn't think about before you built it and uh, until you really tried it out and uh, ran it through the ringer a little bit. With that, you need certifications. You need to protect your IP, right? You need to know 
not only legally, but uh, operationally, how do you protect your IP? How do you get past the market? And I totally agree with Mark. You know, it's a lot of it is just getting out there faster than the next guy because that is sometimes the best way to protect your IP. You know, there's lots of ways, but you need to understand that. You still need to know how to run a business. You need to know how to manage people. You need to know how to direct the team, pull everything together, know what your market wants. You need to know shipping and logistics. You need to know, you know, where you're shipping, how you're shipping, what are the inco terms, all that good stuff. And then you need to know how to get in into retail. Sometimes retailers want different packaging. They want things done in different ways. You have to please your customers in retail. And then finally, you get it out there, you think you're all done, you still have to provide customer service, right? You need to let people know how to use your product, what they do when something goes wrong, and you need to provide that ongoing support. So, long list, <laughs> you got a lot to do, it's not easy. And that's why if you go to these hardware startup meetups, right, probably the one thing you've heard most is that hardware is hard, and it is hard. Um, but we've come a long, long way, right? If you, we've heard all the kind of pretty stories, I think, growing up with the American Dream and uh, Joe Schmo invented this product and he sold a million of them and it was great and he lived happily ever after. If you really look at those stories dating back, there's almost always some significant kind of outlier that that person had a good relationship with a distributor or a lot of money or something that really allowed them in the door to big business and the big business really drove the business. Nowadays it's different. There are a lot of tools that can be used that are making life a lot easier for hardware startups. And I'm gonna give a quick rundown of kind of some of those tools tonight, what they are, how they're changing the space, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the people that I've worked with that are using them and who they are and how they've done that to be successful. So, uh, prototyping. So we've talked about 3D printing. It's great, it's super iterative. You can print it out, you can see what it does, you can try it, you can change it, you can be very quick to go to your next idea. Tech Shop, little plug, absolutely great. Uh, tools, industrial tools. It's hard to do good stuff on domestic products. You need to, as far as like home products, I mean, you need industrial level tools to really get the tolerance and the things that you need uh, working. Co working spaces. So, you know, I'm going to mention actually a lot of people building these tools and in this environment that are here tonight, luckily. So we have Seth Helsley, your hand, and Justin. Blue Sprout and Hollis Works are building co-working spaces that are pulling together real hardware startups, people that are looking to build products. They'll have light industry, prototyping, warehousing, co-working with lots of like-minded people to share ideas. And this is really going to drive the whole prototyping and, and building uh, new products uh, for businesses. You have Arduino, which was mentioned a little bit earlier, which is a new way, an open source platform to uh, bring in electronics and quickly iterate uh, electronics ideas. Next you have funding and market validation. You know, and I, I really put these together as far as crowdfunding goes because um, you know, everyone kind of thinks of, wow, it's great to get money early, it's great the crowdfunding thing, to get money before you're spending it, right? Cash flow, I think I've heard different numbers, but it's usually the 90, 95% of small businesses fail due to cash flow problems, uh, is one set. And crowdfunding is a great way to go because you get the money before you spend it. So you sell your product before you've even made it, before you've spent that money, you get that money, you use it, it's very quick to market. But even more important, I think, with the crowdfunding is the Market validation, you know, you know that people are willing to buy your product. You, otherwise, how do you really know? Your friends and family give you great reviews, you show it to some people. <laughs> Until people start really pulling out their wallets, you know, you don't have good confidence that you're going to give up everything else in your life and spend all your money and sell your car and your wife and your kids and put it all into uh, <laughs> what you really, really need to be doing. Right? <laughs> 
Um, and finally, we're getting angel and VC interest. We actually have Bradley here from Tandem Capital, who is running a hardware division for uh, Tandem Capital, which is now interested in funding hardware startups, which is brand new. I mean, this really didn't happen even a few years ago. Market feedback. So there's other great tools to get market feedback now that we didn't have even a few years ago. Product Me, actually Eric didn't even mention it, but he's part of a group that is creating uh, surveys that can easily give you feedback and have this gamified so that you get points and rewards for giving user feedback on new products. Obviously SurveyMonkey, I guess it's kind of old hat now, but six years ago, yeah, people weren't really using it and it's a great tool for being able to reach out to the people that you're trying to work with. In manufacturing, we also have some new tools. You know, locally, there's some guys called Pictive, which run uh, prototyping kind of 20 to 500 level range of uh, small run manufacturing. There's lots of other small run manufacturers who have kind of existed that are coming into the space and that are popping up out of nowhere to address these this brand new maker movement of well, I've got a few prototypes, I need to get 100 made to test my market. And uh, I can go to these local guys, I can communicate really well, I can get things done really quickly, they can make the product the way I need to, I can be out on the street, I can get feedback and, and be ready to roll very quickly. So uh, Then there's also more folks like us popping up that are managing the overseas communication and you know, I started in China 10 years ago. We, I was working for a tool company that we did $30 million a year as the quality control manager. We had problems, we had drills exploding in people's hands. You know, we had given specifications, we had, we had a team on the ground, we had everything pretty much lined up, but still there was a huge gap between what we were communicating and what we were getting and how we managed that process. And so. Uh, you know, the re original reason I started Berkeley Sourcing Group was to give people that team on the ground. You don't need to learn Chinese, you need, don't need to understand all of the things you don't know, right? We know what you don't know so that we can help guide you and avoid major uh, missteps, which... One thing about hardware is each misstep is potentially fatal. You know, you really need to know how to avoid those and manage those well. Because if you do, if you make a defective product, if you put, if you ship a container of defective product overseas, you know, it's pretty much junk. I've rarely seen a situation where it's even worth it to rework it. You're buying new product and then you're late on your delivery times, which is usually the bigger issue than even the money, so. Uh, logistics, there's a bunch of new logistics folks coming up. Uh, here locally we have uh, Rush Order, Shipwire is a bit more national, and then obviously Amazon, anyone can kind of sign up and get their warehouse and fulfillment done. Sales and distribution is a lot easier. Obviously you have Amazon where you can simply sign up, direct your website is much easier. It's, uh, there's a lot more tools to build websites, e-commerce, to promote your materials. There's also a few, a couple uh, sites coming up. Uh, is Chris here? Uh, we had uh, Chris from Seller who's supposed to be here, but um, there's two sites that are also locally being developed that allow you to pre-sell your product, which is a great way to test your price points and uh, figure out you know, what's working, what's not, before you really hit the market in a big way. So all of this coming together is really making hardware easier. Like it has been difficult. The success stories have been few and far between, but they're really popping up, getting a lot of attention and becoming very real. So a few of the success stories you know, I've worked with particularly. Um, so this is a BKR. Anyone here have a BKR model? Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's surprising. So you, they're, they're getting pretty big. They're in the gap. They're in Crate and Barrel. Uh, so Tal came from a legal background. She had a passion for making something that wasn't a plastic bottle that would uh, leach contaminants potentially and you could drink out of a glass bottle. 
She created BKR. This is a uh, glass bottle with a silicone sleeve. And um, she got into the market really pushing kind of the clean idea, getting out of her uh, kind of lawyer job. And um, she started selling pretty well and better than she expected. And it turned out that it was actually her love for fashion and her beautiful colors and kind of her presentation that was really driving the market. She realized that, she focused on it. Now she's selling nationally and internationally. Spain, Korea, um, they're tripling their uh, sales every year uh, for the last three years. Uh, you have modified watches. Here's kind of another experience on this idea of iteration. And, you know, I think very, it goes through all of the themes that we have tonight is that you have an idea, but you really need your market feedback and your customers and, and those folks to tell you what they want, what they're excited about. And um, Aaron was, uh, he came from consulting in Deloitte. He was doing an MBA program at Haas. He, they had a school project to create a business. So he uh, came across these watches from China, um, modified them a little bit so that they could be easily uh, converted so you have a case and a strap and you can mix and match uh, as you like and it was pretty successful right away as his school project and uh, people really jumped on board and he found some people just loved it. They bought every design, they bought every strap and he had some serious net promoters uh, finished up school, turned it into a business he keyed in on some of the main factors of how that worked and has developed an amazing community of people that just love this product and nurses and some niche markets that you know you wouldn't really expect but through some trial and error and, and some research and good focus you know they've developed a really thriving business. Now you can actually print any design. They just had a successful crowdfunding campaign and uh, you can upload your image, make your own watch for, I think, 60 bucks or something. Um, so in incredibly focused and personalized. Similar goes to Adam Ellsworth uh, with the question block lamp. So Adam was in the tech shop. They did a lot of prototyping for a lot of different companies. Um, they had this idea that, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we had like the question block lamp from Mario as an actual lamp where you hit it and it made the ding sound. <laughs> and uh, so they did it. They made it in the tech shop. Um, you hit this bottom here, it lights up, it makes the ding. Every eight times it gives you the free life. I don't know if you got it. <laughs> uh, sound. And I mean, this kid's face says it all, right? It's just. <laughs> Some people that love, love this whole concept. And uh, so they were making them out of the tech shop for quite a while. Uh, when they needed to boost up production and get to a larger audience, they came to us. We, uh, it was a bit of trial and error, but we uh, created the product. Um, this is what they're looking at getting into national production uh, this year. And finally, and I, I kind of want to focus on this one because I think this is really the quintessential kind of hardware startup product. So Mark Delman started this, he was uh, the founder. He used to be a, the brand manager for Kraft and Xerox and a bunch of other large companies making good money, had a stable life, and um, he was just caught up in this whole maker thing. He's like, wow, this is really cool that I could make my own product. And I happened to, he happened to have uh, chickens. He raised chickens in his house in Palo Alto. He's a big gardener, very organic sort of guy. Um, and there was no good answer to how you uh, water your chickens, how your, how your chickens drink water. Um, typically you put, there are for the industrial world, but not for domestic chickens. So a lot of people, you put the water down, chickens kind of kick up. <laughs> all kinds of stuff, he sees food into their water, they get sick, it's a big problem, you're always changing it. Um, but you know, it wasn't really a big enough niche to attract the big business of the world. So Mark is stuck with this problem, he's frustrated, he thinks, hey, I can do it, I think there's gotta be other people that are feeling this same pain. So quits his job, goes to the tech shop, 
works with uh, the guy who teaches the class, Dan Freshel, of inje injection molding, tries to kind of do the design himself, goes for a while, realizes, well, that's not really working out. There's things he didn't think about. It took him a long time to learn the program. Work with Dan to finalize the engineering. They did some 3D printing, looked good. Uh, he worked with us and we helped him kind of finalize some of the design for manufacturing problems. He did Google AdWords, became, and he somehow got chickenwater.com URL. Was the number one chicken water guy, right? For three months. <laughs> like, you know. And uh, all of a sudden, you know. Whenever anyone is looking for a chicken water, they don't see anything else. <laughs> All they see is Mark Bellman. So <laughs> I think this is really the crux of it all, is that you know there's going to be some great success stories and some big market disrupting forces of makers that can really compete with big business. But as individuals, I think the really cool thing that is about to happen, and it's kind of similar to software, where there's a lot of niche, niches where people aren't served, right? You have question block lamps, you have chicken waters, you have wa watches that are very personable, that people that have that interest, that drive and that passion can now pull together all of the skills and tools to create a business and to satisfy those needs. And so we're, the way I, I see, there's certainly going to be a lot of market changing forces on the big side, but I think this is really how it's going to change our world in the next five years, next ten years, is that products are going to be made you know, by real people, for real people, oh, <laughs> say that again, <laughs> um, oh, just kidding, <laughs> they will though, I promise. <laughs> That uh, you know will really meet the needs of what we're looking for in, in smaller markets, and really open up this whole new product line of the fact that you know we don't need to make a million products. We don't need to make ten million products. You know, if you can make a hundred thousand products a year and sell them into your market, you can have a great lifestyle business. You can piggyback that onto other products. You can really connect with a very significant market in your own very personal way that big business clearly hasn't done for a long time and they're getting farther and farther away from that um, until you know these folks are and us as makers are really forcing them to realize hey there's a lot of good stuff here and we're going to make it ourselves so um, that's my two cents thanks so much And communicate a little bit better. So um, it's I think driven primarily by margin. If the margin is there, it makes more sense to do it locally because it can be a little faster. We have tons of experience and design expertise here. Um, but if uh, you're more cost conscious, uh, it certainly is going to be also more competitive to go overseas. Are there good examples of Model X that they decided that it made more sense to do the final assembly pieces in Austin? when they promoted the, the, the Moto X store where you could configure all your different colors and all that, it made more sense to do that close than to do it overseas and trying to get that done right up there and then bring things over here, so. Yeah, yeah, to that, I mean, there's, there's a huge man management cost of doing things well overseas. And it's not just language, it's cultural. You know, we have a different expectation of our products. If our product breaks, what do we do? We take it back, right, every time. We don't try to fix it. We don't pull out the tools in the garage, and uh, that's a very different culture. In China, if something breaks, nobody has a warranty. You don't go to the back of the store. <laughs> you go to the guy who's right outside your apartment on the street who fixes shoes and bicycles and whatever else, and you give him your product, and he fixes it for you know three bucks. So it's there's a lot more to it, and, and management is a big part of it. Um, so. There's a huge natural advantage to working within your own culture and not having the shipping and time delays as well. Barbara. Across all of the speakers today, you've introduced the power of the maker movement and whatnot. And in particular, with your experience with sourcing of components, do you see a future in which there is a 
vertical integration, a certain level of vertical integration for middlemen providing the services for inventors to the, and then handling the back end of it, the, the sourcing and components and in particular inventory management for those companies as inventors come in and our previous speaker talking about the retail side. Definitely. I mean, that's a, it's a tough question and every space is very, very different, right? I mean, cash flow is huge. So wherever you can save money and go direct and do it effectively, then that's a good idea. But at the same time, it's very, very complex. And so having, I think, especially good high-level guidance, right? It's The main thing is to avoid those huge missteps. If you have something that can go wrong and you know, in hardware, it really goes wrong. And whether it's not identifying the right market, whether it's investing in the wrong tooling, whether it's having defective product, the missteps are huge. And so there's a huge cost savings of just kind of doing things right and avoiding those huge pitfalls. Um, that being said, there's a lot of great tools where you can go direct now. And so you kind of, I think it's important in getting more complex that you have to pick and choose. And, and you certainly have to have, I think, the right people on your team you know, one thing I didn't talk about here, but um, it's pretty uh, relevant, is that in, in all of, I've worked with 600 hardware startups in nine years, and I've seen lots of people not make it, and I've seen some people make it, and there is an incredible correlation between the business sense and marketing ability uh, of the business and their success. I mean, it is almost a direct correlation of how well do they understand their market, how well can they run their business, versus how successful they are. And it's interesting because, you know, first you would think it's about the product, right? It's about, wow, this is a really, really cool product. How can it not work? Well, there's a thousand ways it can not work. And so if you have a good product, uh, or even a decent product, the key is to run your business really well and to get in touch with your market. And like the VKR, you know, they didn't really set out to be a fashion model. And they never would have succeeded with the idea of really a clean water bottle. I mean, that would have maybe had some success. But where they really blew up was that they realized that there were a lot of it's it girls, as they call their target market, where, the, you know, these girls, some of them bought every single color, you know. $60, $30 <laughs> water bottles. Can you imagine? <laughs> a lot of money on water bottles. But they just love the fashion and they really bought in. And um, so you can, you need to have a decent product, but more importantly, you need to run the business really well. And, and that's where you should focus, I think, as far as middlemen and, or just guidance, you know, really getting that support. So. Great, yeah, great. Yeah, so, so I, I just wanted to wrap a, a couple of things up here uh, before we send you back and there's going to be opportunity, there's more beer, more wine, I think the pizza might be gone, but hey, just get your drink on a little bit. Um, and before we go though, you know, we, we get asked the question of why is Transmedia SF doing a Maker Movement event? And, and the reason is this, is, is we, it's all integrated these days. The multi-screen, multimodal world has in many ways enabled this maker movement. It's made hardware easier. It's made it more powerful, cheaper, and faster, as Mark was talking about. And, and it's now becoming integrated. You know, one of the reasons in, in our little logo we have Justin's robot is we're, we're looking at connected devices and connected toys and wearables now in the transmedia world that are going to have new user inputs. So we're really fascinated and excited about this world. And you know, just a couple of things that, you know, what, what our speakers were talking about uh, that make this movement an, an incredibly powerful movement. Uh, Greg talked about two people that had six-figure jobs, Ty that was an attorney uh, and became a maker and has now got a business that is a, a nice lifestyle business. Um, Mark with the chicken water, you know, nice lifestyle business. And by the way, you know, I do a lot of work with venture capitalists, and they consider anything under $20 million a year a lifestyle business. That's a nice lifestyle. <laughs> so, you know, lifestyle business, when you hear that, don't think that these people are barely scraping by. They can be doing very nicely. 
Um, you know, one of the things that Eric said was really fascinating that everybody wants to know how their products are made. You know, you're seeing now even in Burger King, they tell you where the beef is coming from. You know, how many restaurants do you walk into, they tell you where, you know, every ingredient is coming from. We are all fascinated with how our products are being made. And we want to know. And we want that authenticity that comes from the maker movement. And obviously, Mark with Tech Shop, they had an opening in Washington, D.C. He's moving around the country and kind of taking over. He needs to connect with Libby to get this to the younger people. And, you know, one of the things that we're looking to do uh, with Greg and Eric is Hardware Con Cubed. Uh, so this is an event that's going to be happening in October. It's going to accelerate um, uh, hardware and accelerate and elevate hardware startups. Uh, so we're looking for speakers, sponsors, and volunteers. I know a couple speakers I'm going to talk to again. Uh, but if you're interested, come and see one of us, and uh, we'll, we'll look forward to connecting with you. All right, thanks, everybody.